Well, I guess I could. There we go. All right, everybody. Um, is there a way that we could mute new participants in the room? They are also muted, and I'll, I'll keep an eye on it. Don't worry as Sounds well. Good. Thanks, Richard. All right. Um, thanks, everybody, for joining us today. Um, I think... Um, I think I guess the premise of of, of this workshop is I, I I really think that everybody has already been living really a good chunk of our lives. Um, you know, if you if you found your way here um, uh, in in the metaverse, and probably before you realized, um, um, and and before all these sort of big tech um, popularized the term for themselves. Um, you know, in the in the good part of last year. Um, so I guess the purpose of today, um, this part one of the series, is to help people um, understand uh, the gaps between what you already are familiar with, what you're probably using every day in your digital lives, and then um, um, sort of what you're not as familiar with and what you could probably uh, get a lot of um, um, fun out of. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, I, when I tell the story about how I got into this more futurist um, lifestyle um, of this world of blockchain, of crypto, Web3, of the metaverse, um, you know, it involves a lot of acronyms that I don't even fully understand sometimes. Um, but I'm always happy to share that um, it started in the arts for me, um, really at um, the intersection of arts and culture uh, and, and the technologies. Um, and I'm, I'm someone that just really love making connections between different um, disciplines, between different areas. That's always been my professional background. Um, I love um, the more philosophical aspects uh, when it comes to the economic uh, and social structures of what's possible in the metaverse. Um, I love innovation, technology for the sake of innovation. Um, and then, of course, right now, um, I work as a uh, startup uh, entrepreneur. I work at um, T2 as the COO. Um, I'll explain a little bit more about who we are um, later. Um, I'm also doing my uh, MBA at the University of Oxford at the Saudi Business School. I lead uh, the blockchain club here. Um, I'm also part of the Oxford DAO. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about what DAOs are and um, how Oxford is, is stepping into that. Um, it's really, really exciting. So I guess you could say I'm you know, a, a can of soup made of all these different ingredients. This is actually a neat piece of crypto art by the artist who goes uh, by the name of Gamtech. Um, and Polkadot has a bit of special meaning for me. It's the first uh, blockchain ecosystem that I uh, got into when I was introduced. So um, so that's enough about me. Um, let's um, get into it. So today um, we'll start with a bit of a definition of what the metaverse is. Hello. Map. Asad. Let me just say yeah. a few more welcomes. Yeah. So I'll pop a few people on mute here. Yeah. So we like to keep this very, very disgusting. Is that a word? So uh, don't put too much pressure on yourself to kind of jump in and, and, and get into presentation today because uh, we like to drive these kind of MKI style. So um, you can unmute yourself, by the way, if you want to contribute, say things. But if uh, your mic's just on and then i'll go ahead and mute you but welcome new joiners welcome capel alexandra's here mentioned a list already jerry's arrived halil kathleen christina uh I mentioned lauren hello capel nice to see you see um, here to see you <laughs> always like a camera on no pressure but it's always fun to see people see some faces especially for any ones like yours <laughs> thanks uh, rag halves today. What brings you today, Kapil? Just while your mic's on. Oh, the topic was interesting, and I had. Uh, I'm in. I'm in UK, so I can. I can attend. <laughs> <laughs> Have a bit of lunch or something while you watch, right? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Oh, you're very welcome, Ragavs here, Sai's here. Hey, great to see you, Sai. Shiva Kant, wonderful to see you, Saprit, uh, Tanvi. Uh, Valerie's here. How wonderful. Sorry if I've missed anybody there. Noah's here. How great to see you, Noah. I think, I think I've mentioned everybody there. So recording today, we'll pop it up on YouTube later on if you want to catch up on this or recap anything. Um, put your comments in the chat, questions, ideas, hellos, anything you want, your LinkedIn profile if you want people to know who you are and connect with you. Um, we're in great, great company today. We've just been hearing from Sammy. Sammy's got this uh, wonderful background 
Uh, she's over in uh, side business school in, in Oxford, working on MBA, leads the blockchain club over there. She's um, leading at T2. She'll tell you more about that later on. Uh, early interest in polka dots. Uh, I have some polka dot, by the way, Sammy. But, That's uh, great. <laughs> Good for you. Yeah. Yeah. I had to mention that given you put your can of soup up. So yeah. well, welcome, Lubna. Right, back with you, Sammy. Thank you for allowing me to interrupt, which I probably will do from time to time. But uh, yes. we haven't got so long today. So back with you. Yeah, no worries. Um, I, I really like this vibe. Thanks, Richard. Um, so actually, now that uh, we've said hi to everybody, um, maybe I can get a quick read of the room. Um, if people want to put your virtual hands up or your, um, you know, real hands up. Um, does anybody actually work in the metaverse? However you want to define that. And, um, you know, um, you can maybe pop it in the chat, uh, what capacities you work in. Um, and so forth. Um, and then for everybody else um, who are just here to learn, maybe what brings you here, what, what you're looking to get out of the session, um, feel free to use the chat. Um, I have not, I, I, um, I'll have a, a guilty admission here. I um, have not made it to any of the MK events, but I'm really looking forward to um, something this month. Yeah. Plenty to come. You'll be fine. Yeah. Yeah, so so for ourselves, we just finished uh, hosting uh, a session with XRSI, Extended Reality Safety Initiative in Altspace VR. That was very, very interesting. We have regular meetups in spatial. I mean, you said, you know, doing business. I think we're working towards that. Um, anybody, uh, anybody kind of active, anybody building, designing, hosting, working, meeting in the metaverse, any examples? You can just pop it in the chat. You can speak up if you want. Okay, Thomas. Okay, that's Thomas. Great. Yeah. Thomas is a fellow classmate. Good oh, great! <laughs> yeah. Um, excellent. Um, lots of learning um, to be. Excellent. Um, so we will start with uh, speaking of learning. We'll start with the definition uh, of the metaverse. It is a bit tricky to define. Um, I will map the system, give some examples. My favorite examples. Um, and I think they're super fun and super exciting, but I have a bit of an odd idea of fun, so you have to bear with me there. And then I think what's uh, like the heading of um, today's session says, um, we want to talk about how you can contribute uh, if you already, uh, if you're not already. So um, the metaverse doesn't really have, you know, a quick definition. This is, I pulled this from Wikipedia, but this is a horrible definition. Um, don't ever quote from it. Um, and if anybody has a, a good definition that they like um, that really resonates with them, um, feel free to share that in the chat. Um, and then hopefully by the end of today, you'll walk away with your own idea of how, um, what the metaverse represents for you and what that looks like going to the future. Um, this is something that really resonates strongly with me. Um, Shelly Sin, she writes on Medium, uh, so I pulled this from one of the red blogs. And she said that metaverse is not a trend. It is not just a technological breakthrough, it's a cultural shift. And that really resonates strongly with me because it redefines how we work and interact with people. Um, and that for me is really um, the, um, the, the core of what's happening here. Um, it really is that the idea that everything is, is shifting from underneath our feet. Um, and then from the more technical side, you can think of it as layers of the internet. Um, when I was explaining this, I, I thought, oh yeah, that makes sense because the internet itself is made up of different layers of protocols. Um, and that makes up really most of the, the infrastructure layer uh, of the metaverse. Um, the, the kind of the highway system. Is Ryan the CEO? Lines. Um, thank you for meeting yourself. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the highway system that en enables and powers um, everything that happens on top of it. And then there's the human interface, which is everything from, you know, your computer mouse, your smart glasses, the computer um, that you are, the screen that you are watching this from um, is part of that interface and how you interact with the metaverse. Um, and then there's the, my favorite, which is the decentralization aspect of the metaverse. Um, a lot of uh, what um, decentralization is all about is, is embodied in, in some of these uh, really cool projects that I was sharing. Um, and then there's the spatial computing, which um, um, you'll be, I think a lot of people will be more familiar with here. Um, so that's the VRAR, the immersive experiences, 3D engines that allow people to create these experiences. 
And then speaking of creation, um, there's on top of that, there's the creator economy, which includes everything from the tools that creators can use to the marketplaces that enable transactions and commerce um, of these assets, digital assets. Uh, and then there's the discovery, um, which is a very closely um, related to how we already live our digital lives. So all the social media apps that they use that recommend content to you, um, advertisements or organic uh, content. Um, and there's a whole lot of trust and ethic issues that's coming out of that particular layer, uh, which we'll dive into a little bit later. And then the experience, which is how you how you how we all experience uh, the metaverse on the day to day. So that could be through video games, through social media, uh, esports, uh, streaming, uh, shopping. And so, uh, Sammy, some people are just looking at that top layer and saying, yeah. hey, you know, what's new here? We've had Second Life in the past. The kids have been playing Minecraft for years. Ah, you know, here's some new UXs, right? But it, it's the layers underneath that that we can get pretty excited about. What, what's, what's really new here, in your opinion? Um, decentralization and spatial computing are certainly the largest um, in terms of technology, technology advancements. That's certainly uh, what's new. And then, of course, human interface, which goes with um, all of that. Um, and then I think not technology aside, the big cultural difference is the creator economy. Um, of course, it's enabled by the new technologies um, such as blockchain, but um, creator economy is really blurring the lines um, between consumers and users and creators. Um, so now you can all at once be a consumer of an experience, but also participate in the creation of it, uh, which is a big part of, of what to me defines the metaverse. Um, what, what does that mean? I mean, we can all be content yeah. creators now, we can vlog, we can blog, we can post. Yeah. Are you talking about artists here, designers or content creators of, of how we think about it now? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, essentially, all of all of the above, um, and I can actually um, move to an example. Um, I'll come back to this later. Um, I love this chart. Wow. But I'll come back <laughs> in a quick second. We could spend some time um, on that, couldn't we? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so to answer your question, Richard, um, yeah, I, it, for example, we are looking at. Um, does anybody know um, Richard? Probably you, you know this is this is Fortnite on the left, and then. Uh, this, uh, I'm not quite getting any Nintendo fans here. This is Animal Crossing. Oh, um, yes, yes. Yeah. So um, in, in Fortnite, for example, you are at the same time consuming this concert experience, right? This is Marshmallow's concert um, in Fortnite. Um, but every player is contributing also to, the, to building the environment. Uh, they're bringing their own elements to a customization. Their interactions bring value to, the, to, that, climb, um, to that environment, uh, which shapes the experience as well. And just um, and then all the technologies that are underneath um, all of that just enable this experience to go a little bit more smoothly, um, a bit more intuitive, and uh, a bit more integrated. So at the moment, uh, any content we create, we're kind of expected to do it for free, aren't we? If we start a podcast, it's expected to be free. There's a, and then the problem with that is that we've seen the kind of all the profits have risen to the top. And that the, the platform holders, the Googles, the whatever, have, have actually made all the money because they've used that data and they've you know, allowed it to in, improve their advertising experience to, to collect more customers. Is that yeah. likely to be the same or potentially does the decentralized, the horizontal aspect of this change? Um, really good point. Um, hopefully not the same at all. Um, I mean, this is why I'm in, uh, you know, the space um, because we want to disrupt all of that. Um, it's just it doesn't make sense in an economy in the Internet age where you have resources that are really contributed from all sorts of, um, you know, all angles, every single user contributes to uh, Facebook's um, economic value, and yet the users do not um, and are not compensated for that, are not included in the value chain. Um, uh, and um, decentralization will, will certainly change all of that. Um, and I think a good um, question that I get quite a bit is if um, you know, generally speaking, people think of uh, metaverse as uh, meta or, um, you know, if people are familiar with the film, Radio Player One, um, I really like the movie, but um, no, hopefully the future is not like that at all. It's, it, it, the metaverse would only make sense if it's decentralized. Otherwise, we're not changing much of anything at all. So I know John from, from LinkedIn, and he's actually offered to come and speak to us for us some time. But if I'm being critical here, the, the, the names at the top of this list are all incumbent. They're all large. They're all the big names. They already have a, a dominance in technology. 
you know, why do you think John's put them at the top? Is he telling us that they're still going to be the leaders in this space? Or is it, is it just the ones we're familiar with, do you think? Um, I think it's it's both, um, but I do think that all of this will change. I mean, this has already changed since the last time I gave this presentation, um, and it's, things have shifted around a little bit. We're seeing, um, and and it's not to say um, because the last time I remember talking about this with with a friend, and he said, "Well, surely Meta, with all its resources and um, you know uh, existing customers, they they can outcompete any new coming uh, players." And I said, "Sure, um, but it's not about taking." you know, uh, taking away their pieces of the pie. It's making the whole pie bigger so that all these other uh, smaller players, especially on the decentralized spec spectrum, can participate and compete as well. And let's take a half step back here. I mean, how, how big is this this change? Some people like to play it down. Paul Levy likes to play it down. He's here. I'm sure he'll speak up. But what is this? Is this like going from typewriters to personal computers? Is it going from PCs to app-based smartphones? Is it different? How should we think about this um, progression? Um, that's a really good question. Um, I haven't thought about, I just know that it's big enough to bet my whole career on it and <laughs> my whole life on it. <laughs> um, but I haven't thought of it in terms of analogies or uh, quantities. Um, it's it's just, I, I, but I embrace change, right? And all the risks that are associated with it. So I decided to jump straight in. Um, it's all the promises. For me, it's really all the promises that were supposed to be the internet um, that hasn't quite realized in the internet age, right? Because we went from a very free and open internet um, to this very much centralized um, information and data in the hands of a few sort of platform economy. Um, and this next iteration of that uh, is really what the internet is meant to be. Um, so it's decentralized and distributed. Um, it's a great point. We can all praise the technology we have. Look, we're on Zoom today. It's a magnificent yeah. experience of what it is. But let's also remember that Chrome browser largely hasn't changed in the in the nine, 10 years that we've had it because of these things you're talking about, monopolistic practices, keeping out the innovative startups, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that's, that's the big opportunity here, isn't it? Yeah. Great. Um... Let's, uh, oh, so um, I talked about. Hey, Caesar. <laughs> it's really nice to see um, people's faces as well. I love it when people put cameras yeah. on, especially Caesar. He's always smiling. <laughs> um, <laughs> We're the same like that. Yeah. Um, so let's get into a little bit of the less familiar names on that chart. Um, I, I wonder if people will recognize, um, so we have Bored Apes here, CryptoPunks, and MeBits, uh, which is all part of what is now the Yuga Labs um, NFT metaverse after their acquisition of Larva Labs. Um, and I am so, I'm myself not a huge fan. Uh, <laughs> I, I do think that it's a little bit antithesis, but there's some exciting things happening. Uh, You're not a fan of what, NFTs in general, or just some of the- Of large market cap NFTs. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah, um, is, is, it seems that, um, and, and this is something that is criticized um, often, right, in the, in the NFT space in particular, but also over um, Web3 and crypto is, um, are we just recreating existing power dynamics um, in, the, um, in, in the current world? Um, and then taking so that off. Let's yeah. tune into that for a bit then. So yeah. um, let, let's just check everyone's knowledge here. When we talk about NFTs, non-fungible tokens, let's just see. So can I, look, this is a safe space, right? You, you don't need to know what an NFT is, right? But you should say, because then we've got a chance to get on the same page. So um, an NFT knowledge, zero to 10, everybody just put it in. What, where are you at? Are you, tech, are you an expert? Can you talk about the board eight club? strategic plans or you know okay so richard two one okay all right three one now this is great paul 11 genius and the message deborah six okay let's have a few more five thomas thank you sue seven very good jerry six and a half six jerry's being very Odelia, precise ten. Yeah. <laughs> it's a bold move odelia you might get caught on <laughs> no she does know a lot about it I'm, I'm kidding hey jonathan great to see you 
Uh, okay, so we've got a lot of ones, twos, threes there, Sammy. Some, some, some mid table as well. That's great. So we better have a let's have a quick what is an NFT, and then let's come back around to what you were saying about some of the problems that you see with this. Yeah, of course. Um, an NFT is uh, the the full uh, the full um, of it is non fungible tokens, and what it is, it's it's a bundle of rights that that says that you own something um and it, and it's a uh, a bond of rights that is recorded what makes it special is that this bond of this particular bond of rights is recorded on um blockchain and so that is uh, immutable and uh, which means that nobody can change it um and so you can always prove hey um this piece of data says that I, I have a certain bundle of rights. And what this bundle of rights could represent um, uh, is, is quite varied. Um, so in this case, uh, with Bored Apes, it's the JPEG of this particular ape, but it's also all the IP that is associated with it, um, which is granted by the owners, um, by, the, by, the Yuga, by Yuga Labs. So. so when this started, I just thought this was a way of protecting your digital assets. That from being copied or, or or whatever, like you would, you know, an original painting will always be the original, have its own value. That wasn't the case in digital, but then they they used beyond that. So if you take some of the incredible infrastructure you were talking about in that slide, what we saw, I think it was seven layers, wasn't it? That, yeah. that John had um, we detailed. That the powerful bit is the blockchain part of this, and if you take one metaverse, world, space, whatever you want to call it, we could look at Decentraland. And Decentraland might have a kind of clunky, um, you know, 1999 video game, <laughs> maybe UX to it. But the back end is, is very, very forward thinking. And it and it's a DAO, right? It's a decentralized autonomous organization with a certain number of uh, units in the space. And, the, and those units and those who hold the cryptocurrency have voting rights. And it is all managed by that community who own it which makes it very interesting. It makes it a very difficult acquisition target for anybody else in the market and, and means that it can run it autonomously, its own rules and, and plans. Uh, so um, that is powered by NFTs, isn't it? I mean, those are smart contracts, much like um, buying a JPEG, right? Yeah, so the digital assets uh, in a uh, platform like Decentraland or um uh, there's there's a sandbox, for example, um, yes. everything from parcels of land to you know avatars, um, clothing objects, shoes, most likely, <laughs> um, people's fascination with shoes as collectibles. Um, um, all, all of these digital assets could be NFTs uh, and tradable, uh, and with a provenance tracked through. Yeah. Okay, so it, it's a it's a means of immutably proving ownership of a digital asset. Exactly. Yeah. And, and and for for whatever reason, like we described in Central, or because you you want to buy it and believe it's going to hold its value or, or grow in value, as some people are speculating. Um, yeah, for sure. And um, I think every day, you know, people are coming up with opportunities with ways to utilize these NFTs. Um, for example, for one of my school projects, I um, wrote a paper about how uh, you could use NFTs as as a gate to certain um, on chain experiences. Um, you know, this was a virtual room that we envisioned um, that could visualize video NFTs, um, but that is a, not quite far off, but it is a bit far off of, of a dream. Um, um, so just different ways to give people a bit more utilities, um, utility with the NFT. Yeah. I could see how Banksy or, or someone like that could get into this and, and design some NFTs that would be very valuable, but that's not been the case. I mean, who who were these Board Eight Club, you know, Board Eight Yacht, whatever? They are. Yeah. But, you know, who were these people? Were they nobody, and they just just decided to jump on this trend? I mean, how did they go from having never heard of them to millionaires or billionaires or whatever they are now? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, we definitely see uh, some contemporary artists announcing their plans uh, entering into the NFT space. Um, but largely um, how it started was with cultural, um, it's, a, it's a cultural shift, right? Going back to, to the metaverse being a cultural shift. Um, it's, it's cultural leaders, people who wanted to create uh, a different um, type of um, almost a subculture, but now of course uh, board apes is, is mainstream. Um, but started off uh, quite niche. Um, and if we go back all the way to early, I don't know the um, details of uh, the board ape people in particular, but no. uh, my favorite, one of my favorite stories, 
yeah, one of my favorite stories uh, would go back to CryptoKitties, uh, which was one of the, um, it's not as old as CryptoPunks or MeBits, but it's right up there with them. Um, and CryptoKitties uh, started uh, actually with a, with a group in Vancouver called Dapper Labs. And, um, and they created uh, CryptoKitties during the 2017 uh, cryptocurrency crash um, because they wanted to come up, uh, you know, with different ways to um, to use to use the technology outside of um, cryptocurrencies um, to see what they could create um, with it. And then they actually created the ERC-721 standard, uh, which is used for Ethereum uh, smart contracts uh, for to create the NFTs. Um, so that's a bit of NFT history. Um, and and has, has the boat sailed? I mean, Thomas there says his wife, an artist, is looking at getting into this market. You know, can his wife make $10,000 now? Can she make $10 million now? I mean, where, where, what's the situation? Um, it's, uh, it's very, so I think what you're asking, Richard, is where does the, where is the value derived um, from the, uh, from the NFTs? Um, and uh, thanks, Paul, I'll come back to you uh, for your question. Um, and um, the, the question, the answer to that question is very nuanced. Um, so if you think about um, arts and collectibles and uh, uh, cultural collectibles, um, how they derive value is in the community that, that believes in it, in the value. Um, utility is a very small part of it. Um, but for example, people are in it uh, for speculative reasons. People are in it because they believe that it represents uh, a part of their digital identity. Um, I am one of those people that collect NFTs that resonate with my digital identity uh, or with my, or really the digital and, um, you know, my, my, my real identity. It is part of my real identity. And I resonate with the, with the culture that's represented by certain NFTs, for example, then I see a lot of value in collecting that and being a part of that um, club, so to speak. Um, uh, Paul, you want to jump in? Yeah. Yeah, I guess I just wanted to uh, look beyond the current model of NFTs, because again, in the kind of philosophical futurist world, um, one of the difficulties of digital innovation is when it simply replicates. And so when NFT with the concept of ownership simply replicates the physical world concept of ownership, um, we have a problem with ownership at the moment in the world and the whole issue around trust. We have the difficulty of the grasping nature of ownership, the environmentally destructive nature of the current form of capitalism, the kind of dubious morals around one dictator saying that they think they can claim another country through invasion. And that's, you know, not only in the part of the world that's on the media at the moment. So models of capitalism, versions of capitalism have come under criticism for a while. They're seen as now quite juvenile and I say environmentally destructive. And so the whole rise of things like the Creative Commons license, which is huge, is actually the non-non-fungible token. It's the uh, ability to express through work that can't be owned by anybody. Um, and actually, when I write for magazines like The Conversation, I give my copyright away to an extent because anyone else can do it. So um, I think what's gonna happen is when we sort of ditch these very um, you know, greed grasping natures of NFTs, even the word collect, Sammy, you know, I want to collect. When you collect something, you reduce its right to be anywhere else. Um, you know, and so models about sharing, about collaboration go out the window with NFTs in a lot of cases when it's rooted in this slightly old version of capitalism. So I'm just wondering, here's the sort of question, is the technology around blockchain and the and NFTs could be actually where what we do is um, we create code around the right for something to exist and not be deleted. Uh, which could happen when also AI becomes, you know, a bit more apparently self-aware. Um, it will be the right for something not to be owned. It will be that this particular digital asset cannot be owned by anybody. Um, and so I just wonder, is our fixation on F NFTs around ownership is actually a bit pathetic? Um, really good points. And I have a lot of opinions in that. Um, I'm going to try and keep it condensed, but uh, I'm really glad you brought up, you know, Creative Commons, the idea of public goods, digital assets being public goods. Um, that resonates very strongly with me as well. Um, I think there is a case for every tool. Um, what you're describing is using seeing the technology in a very, very different way. And there are very valid uh, use cases for that. Um, the idea of collection of private ownership, um, I don't know if that would ever go away. Um, just there are some assets that maybe um, would just not serve its purpose as public 
goods. Um, and I can um, actually, I'm going to jump ahead because this is very relevant to what I want to talk about. So um, this is a, a mock-up of, of actually my day, day job. Uh, this is T2. Um, and we are creating a platform where um, content, uh, written content can be shared as common goods, as public goods. Um, and that's not just any content, but it's curated content um, and curated through token curated registries, um, which create you know, these high quality um, art feature length articles for every relevant community um, and to be as public goods to be used by that community. And I these are what, not what, treated. Yeah, what I was suggesting, Sammy, is I think yeah. the most exciting metaverses, and they're, and they're gonna be big careers in this, which are just at the next phase, where I think we'll ditch a lot of ownership, will be um, metaverses where ownership is, uh, is not a natural law, where there won't even be public ownership because there won't even be ownership. Mutability will become a new value. I love that. Um, I'd love to get into a bit more of that offline with you, Paul. Um, but for the sake of time, I think I want to move on. Yeah, it's uh, fine. Rain it in, Sammy. It's all good. Yeah. Paul doesn't mind. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. <laughs> um, Actually, I skipped through this uh, this little bit. So um, I wanted to dive into the, the discovery vertical next because it's also so tied into our daily experience with the metaverse. Um, and this is where a lot of these problems um, that, that we're concerned with um, surface, right? Um, who gets to control what you see? Who gets to control what information gets pulled uh, from you, from your experience? And who gets to control what content gets pulled or gets pushed um, to your daily um, daily interactions, right? And that's kind of the questions that we have with companies like Facebook. Um, and um, I think what we hope to see in the next uh, stage of uh, the internet age is content that is community driven, community owned, possibly, um, or um, if if um, or and uh, even things like. Um, uh, real-time use data that is used to curate uh, people's um, attention, but um, by um, by real people, um, and that is um, using data in a completely different way. Um, there are a number of solutions that want to that want to help with this. Um, my good friends uh, at Swash they developed a protocol that essentially they call themselves a data union, which is um, taking all of the data that all these companies collect from you on a daily basis and then selling them on your behalf and then giving you a portion of the proceeds um, uh, just because in the near future they don't see the idea of, I mean because data has value and, um, and if everybody could benefit from that that might be a, a, a positive um, cycle a positive value cycle that we want to be a part of um, and then as I was talking about with T2 we try to um, we want to give people back um, their power over their data and what they want to do with it. And then very importantly, um, allowing them to use that data to create, uh, to curate content for their daily consumption that is um, you know, away from all the noise and, that you see uh, in a lot of platforms uh, in social media um, and really give them their attention back and their time back. Um, and if you're interested in, in, in this, I can, I would love to connect and um, it's uh, we're looking for um, we're hiring we're also looking for contributors in all sorts of ways Paul would love to hear your thoughts um, if when you get a chance to learn a bit more about it um, and to everybody else here feel free to connect with me afterwards if you want to learn more and uh, see what this is all about um, and then um, this is a the next vertical that really excites me, which is the creator economy. So what I was saying earlier about this blurring of lines between uh, consumption and creation, where you're consuming and cons and creating at the same time uh, with every social interaction that you now have, with every interaction that you now have in the metaverse. For example, uh, in this conversation just now earlier, we had Paul contributing, we had Richard contributing, and all of us were bringing our unique value to this conversation. And when the technologies that we're all talking about, when they become mature enough and sophisticated enough, they are then they will then become better at capturing this value, and then distributing that value back to the people that have you know um, contributed to bring that about. Um, and um, I let's see, do I have a little bit of time? Um, maybe we could come back to this. We've got time later because for people who haven't been inside, um, you know, one of these. Um, uh, creator economy uh, platforms. I'd love to take you on a tour um, to one of them. Um, this one in particular. This is actually a Crypto Kitty gallery. Um, 
And um, you'll see that the aesthetics are, are quite, um, um, uh, you, say, you could say OG, um, it's, they're um, not so, quite. Sorry, so do, yeah. do they own this gallery or are they hosting it in somebody else's metaverse? What, what's oh, the right yeah. terminology? Do we say metaverse, metaverse world, metaverse space? Yeah, I don't like saying metaverse because it really then simplifies the term. But when you say it, people understand it. Oh, yeah, it's one you know, universe. It's one um, world, I guess you could, you could say, um, a domain. Um, um, I, I call it, I, I use platform. I like the name platform just because it is it's it is very accurate. Um, um, should, I, should we imagine that the, the connected metaverse or is it potentially going to be more like a multiverse where you're in this one and it's got nothing to do with that one? Yeah. You, you know, you know what, what do you think? Yeah, um, we are so far from any of those versions right now. <laughs> All of these platforms, right? They don't, they're not interoperable. They're right standalone, now. right? They don't right. speak to each other. Yeah. Um, can, can you do, can you do anything? Can you take a pair of glasses that you bought from anywhere to anywhere else at the moment or, or not at yeah. all? Ideally, I mean, that would be the utopia, right? Um, that would be the utopia so that the economy would be truly open. Um, okay. Yeah, with all of the uh, platforms talking to each other, um, or maybe we'll get rid of platforms altogether, right? Um, it's, it's, it will be interesting to see. Okay, so standalone at the moment. And uh, what, what is this space here? What's it called? Um, actually, you had a good question earlier. I, I don't know who owns this gallery. I just know that they use it to show um, CryptoKitties and which is, um, uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's a, it was a breeding game for, for cats. Um, okay. and, uh, and based on the, how cute the cats are and what quality of traits they have, uh, the value was, was People go in through an app, a browser, a VR headset to this. Yeah, so for, um, uh, this is CryptoVoxels, um, this platform, you can enter through a browser or you can use a VR headset. Um, okay. And there's there's definitely it, more than crypto. Is it worth getting? I mean, I I'm, I'm not asking for me here, yeah. but is it worth getting a VR headset now? What you know? Ooh, do, that's a good question. Um, at the right I mean, time? Are they quite expensive? Uh, I mean, I got mine recently. I think it was. Uh, I, I would I say they're still quite uh, on the pricey end, uh, given that their functionalities are still quite limited, their processing power and etc. But um, I I got mine. Um, um just uh a month just about a month ago um definitely worth the investment for myself um you know because i work in the space i, I live and breathe it and yeah. what did you buy um i got a uh quest uh what is it now two uh, okay um, the, the meta yeah. quest two or the office yeah. as it was called yeah. Let, and let's just check in with everybody here there's 32 of us including my friendly note taker bot yeah. on the call <laughs> and who, who's got a vr headset here uh, just give me a yes or no to start with, and then I'll, I'll ask the people who said yes. Richard, yes, you've got one. What have you got? Mine's uh, Oculus Quest 2. Same, okay. Will, what have you got? The Rift. Ah, thank you. Okay. Borrowed one. Yes, Deborah. No, says Lauren. Quest 2 for Phil. Quest 2, Odelia. No, says Caesar. Not yet, uh, says Sue. Sorry, still getting over a bit of a <clears throat> thing, so forgive me for <laughs> doing that. Uh, okay, so so the, the Quest 2, obviously, much better price than HTC or Pico, or you'll tell me all the, all the other ones, I'm sure. Um, we, we could get into why it's cheaper and we get into surveillance capitalism, but that's definitely not for today. But it, it is, if we put that to one side, and we shouldn't, but if we did, it's an exceptionally good value piece of kit, really, isn't it, Sammy? Uh, yeah. $300, 300 pounds. Um, and you, you can just go in the, the app store on there and you can, you can download these kind of galleries. And within a couple of minutes, you can actually be stepping into them. And then it, it really is immersive, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so let's pretend we've put a headset on. We're now going into this gallery, are we? Um, yeah, well, um, I I would love to. Maybe we can circle back to this at the end um, because I really, <laughs> really want to get to this next part. <laughs> well, John, there's a couple um, of questions, so do you want me to hold those yeah. then? Uh, yeah, let's hold the questions. I um, oh, uh, oh, Alexandra is doing some very fast research. Um, yeah, let's circle back to the questions at the end. Oh, no, she's man. on your platform already. Yeah. <laughs> Told me about it ages ago. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Um, okay. So um, we did touch a little bit on uh, spatial computing. Uh, I just want to quickly show, uh, this was my first selfie taken in, in VR. So this is 
oh which one was me i, I was the fox yeah <laughs> the fox um, on the right with the exactly yeah this course. this was a um this was actually um jessica on hell on um, jessica angel she um was actually the person who introduced me to to all of this um and this is her artwork uh presented in vr but it actually exists in the physical world a very cool piece um that used uh a, a really number of different spatial computing technologies um but let's uh let's go ahead to the decentralization layer because this is where i get super excited and um we could get really lost in here but i would try to um kind of um touch on the the, the really critical components um um this is a quote that I caught um, a couple of weeks ago from Rachel Bossman. She's a trust fellow at the university here. Uh, she gave a lecture that really, really struck a chord uh, with me. Um, she said that trust is not being lost. It's just shifting from institutional trust to a more distributed version uh, of trust um, where you know people are held accountable for the actions. There's a lot of transparency um, uh, and that's all thanks to decentralization and it's bottom up. Um, um, uh, design, really. Um, so Richard talked about DAOs. I want to do a bit of a deep, deep dive on DAOs just now. Um, so decentralized autonomous organizations are um, at the core of it, the, the better way to organize resources in the internet age, because corporations, as we said, have taken this uh, top-down approach in organizing um, resources and extracting value um, from that structure. Um, and that really worked well in the industrial age, but it's just not working in the internet age. Um, so we see all these problems with, with trust, for example, with misuse of data. Um, but also they're, they're easily, could easily become stagnant, become stalled, um, lack of innovation, et cetera, not pushing us quite um, you know, what we are capable of. And the better way to organize is through DAOs. Um, and how DAOs organize themselves, they are smart contracts that organize around a uh, central business logic. So they're able to allocate resources and that's money, cryptocurrencies and people um, around this business logic. I put business in quotation marks because it doesn't have to be for profit, right? Certainly nonprofits, a lot of DAOs are nonprofit. Um, they organize them for social causes. Um, um, for example, Ukraine DAO was created solely for the purpose of raising money um, for those affected by the war. Um, and here is um, a really good um, landscape summary from Cooper Turley. Um, Sammy, is it is a DAO elite? Can you can you not create a limited company now? You can create a DAO company. Um, so, if you're talking about how DAOs fit within the legal framework of is that what you're asking? Yeah, I mean, it's a, yeah. I know the answer, but yeah, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, of course. Um, unfortunately, no. So they they don't exist within legal frameworks just yet. They are code. They're just code. Um, we have to come up. Our regulators need to come up with right. solutions. Fast. So you still have a traditional company, and then that company yeah. uses this as a kind of operating model. Yeah, and that happens in different ways to different degrees, right? For example. Um, um, certain DAOs will be created by an operating company and that company may continue to operate it or they may contract, start contract or the DAO may decide to employ other contractors to keep building it. Um, and these contractors may be companies or um, uh, individuals. Um, and that's kind of where this future of work comes in, um, which I know people are eager to um, get into, but I will touch a bit more on that in the second part of the series. Um, but so yeah, DAOs exist for different purposes. Um, these collector DAOs really influence uh, the culture, as I said, um, of the metaverse. Um, so what is uh, considered pop culture, they kind of set a lot of the tone for that. Um, and then of course there's um, more, uh, what I think are very cool. Um, there's a lot of very strong voices in, um, in uh, inclusion um, in the DAO landscape. So her story DAO is one of that, making sure that uh, women and marginalized genders are not written out of you know, this movement. Um, and the investment DAOs, which um, startups like T2, like us, uh, benefit from um, as well, um, a different way of venture capital. Um, and, um, and grants, um, there's a lot of exciting grant programs out there for people who want to get into the space um, in any kind of capacity, technical or non-technical. Um, and I highly encourage you to, to really good, uh, do a decent amount of research on that. I would definitely touch on it in the next part of the series as well. Um, and essentially, um, of course, I'll expand on it uh, next week, but um, 
the um, different ways to contribute to a DAO are kind of, uh, again, I love layers. Uh, everybody loves layers, right? We all need layers. Um, the uh, You can um, participate as a token holder, um, as a network contributor, which means you're bringing your ideas, uh, you're bringing your, some expertise to the table in a non-organized or non-structured way. And then bounty hunters claim kind of you know special projects with different deliverables and, and specific quantified rewards. Um, for DAOs. And then there are the core contributors. So as Richard mentioned, the um, limited companies that may be um, uh, primarily taking on the bulk of the work in, in building out the DAO and operating it. Um, and the reason um, that everybody will probably, or not everybody, but most people will very likely will end up working for a DAO or several DAOs, um, you know, in different capacities on different layers. Um, it's because that you will have more autonomy um, as a participant in a DAO rather than an employee of a large corporation. Um, and the decentralized economy will just simply be bigger and grow faster and will be more resilient than centralized ways of organization. Um, um, that really will be um, a, a better way of living for everybody. Um, and then I really wanted to touch on um, this side, especially um, the yeah, so yes, you can decentralize universities and academia and scientific research. Um, I love talking about that in, especially in the Oxford context. Um, and I see a lot of, um, especially in, with a graduate student doing scientific research, um, their pain points in funding and information access could really be solved um, by using blockchain to mediate all these different actors and incentives. Um, especially in terms of dealing with um, kind of these institutional problems of who gets funding, um, who gets to publish, um, and so forth. Um, NFTs, we already touched on, um, but I, I will put in a plug here um, for Blending's workshop, which is uh, going to be a deep dive on uh, the metaverse and the NFTs, and that's going to be happening next, next week. Um, so make sure you tune into that. Um, and I'll just quickly wrap up with a summary on human interfaces and, and infrastructure. Um, so human interfaces, everything from the mouse that you're using, right, to Oculus, the headsets that we were talking about, full body suits, wearables, um, Fitbits, um, even um, shoes that have um, chips in them, and then eventually um, human computer interfaces, right, so uh, injected chips and, and, and whatnot. Um, I'm personally pretty excited about them probably freaks a lot of people out, but we will see how they turn out. Um, and the infrastructure, um, uh, again, um, um, cloud computing, uh, a big one, um, 6G networks coming up, um, far edge computing, allowing more distributed networks um, and so forth. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the key part of what I wanted to, to present today. Um, I've loved the discussion so far. So let's, um, and on this quite big question. So <laughs> where do you see areas of concern regarding ethics? Um, and they are everywhere, so so feel free. Um, uh, Sammy, thank you so much for taking us to that presentation, allowing me to interrupt you so many times and still keeping your flow, which is very impressive. Um, so you. we've got about uh, 15 minutes um, and we've got uh, 30 odd of us in, in the room today. So. Yeah. Um, that's a great question. Let's loop around to that question. So, so people are here thinking about um, what I mean, how do they utilize the platforms? How do they create things? You know, you've got technology plans here, you've got design plans, you've got uh, content creation plans. Um, what, what about you, Sammy? How, how did you get started to say that your business is now, you know, metaverse dependent? Um, yeah, so with T2 in particular, let me shift us to a bit of a cheerful, more cheerful slide. Um, so I love this one. Um, I sign off everything with uh, everything that I love in one picture, which is cats, rainbows, and unicorns. And this one creature has all of it. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, how did I, uh, well, for us, it was, it was quite simple. Um, uh, T2, our tagline is actually a metaverse of narrated, uh, of curated uh, narratives. Um, and that's, we started with a very kind of overwhelming problem um, for us personally, which was um, how come we can't find the time to read anymore? It's, it's quite difficult. And when you do want to, you know, um, outside of a book, of course, books, um, 
long, long form consumption, um, people find their ways, but with articles, with ed- any kind of educational content, with even videos, um, podcasts there, you know, my wish list for podcasts is like 50 episodes long and I haven't gotten around to them. Um, and it's because um, there's a lot of noise and it's really, really difficult to focus. Um, so with Chichu, well, we said, well, the solution must be that first of all, you have a really good experience. And let's start with reading because reading is easy to easier to solve than other types of media. Um, let's start with reading. Let's help people really focus. And then let's create a, a value chain, um, right? An economy around it so that people are incentivized to read, um, but also this economy guarantees that they have high quality content to read. Um, and so- I mean, there's, there's relevancy and there's quality there, isn't there? I mean, yeah. every 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 podcast or episode ever tells you it's brilliant. Yeah, but it, yeah. you know, the audio quality <laughs> might be awful, the content, yeah. might be, the editing might be awful, yeah, or it might not be relevant. Is those the kind of things that you're digging into? Exactly. Yeah. So that's kind of some of the problems that T2 wants to solve is using the correct incentives to make sure that people who um, give us, you know, so um, what I said earlier about everybody else being in this virtual call together are contributing to this call, to this content. And it's true, right? Um, for example, I'll take content from people's feedback, people's questions and iterate on this, on this um, session. But, um, and then in, in, in the teacher metaverse, what you're doing is you're taking, uh, we're taking people's attention and looking at what people are focusing on, um, what people likes to read and what they want to actually finish reading. Then we say, well, that's a strong signal that if you gave, you know, 10 minutes of your time reading this entire article from start to finish, you must think that it's good content and that other people would benefit from reading it. So we take that signal and we reward people uh, for it. Um, and then the question we get is where does reward come from? Well, people pay subscriptions already for, um, you know, um, high, high quality content. Um, so it is a subscription model, except the 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 subscription fees never leave the economy right they're deposited into the economy and that's circulated to and distributed to people who who help create it so and what token does that use um it will be a native token um and we call it txt which is time times time because when time when your time and my time reach consensus value is generated okay and and the uk announced its support for stable coins yesterday yes um we That's had a fun analogy. Um, I'm sorry. That's different to what you're describing, though. Isn't it? Um, different, but we actually had a, a fun discussion the other day with an investor about. Um, well, and he said, "Well, TXT is technically a stable coin because it's pegged to the value of human attention." And I said, "Well, yeah, let's let's do that. Let's run with that. That's that's an that's excellent. Very interesting. Yeah." Yeah. So stable coins usually peg to the dollar, I guess, aren't they? Or maybe yeah. a euro or something. Yeah. But thinking, yeah. it's a bit like Paul said earlier, wasn't it? Thinking beyond those boundaries yeah. that aren't necessarily real. Um, there's a couple of questions coming. So Jonathan uh, has raised this question about what about creating new platforms? I mean, if we think about social media, you know, we could all name the four or five ones that we know every day. But in fact, there's, there's, there's thousands and there's probably tens of thousands that have ever been created that, yeah. that we don't know about. Is this going to be a make, make a platform, but unless it's wildly successful, you'll disappear to the metaverse graveyard? Or are, are we, if you have 100 users in a five years from now, is that actually potentially a successful viable platform business? Um, I'd say probably not. <laughs> so, um, yeah, you're right. If Network people disappear there. into the graveyard. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that's happening every day, right? We just don't know um, because we don't ever see them before they before they disappear. Um, so that, no, there's nothing uh, preventing you from creating a new platform tomorrow, um, but who is going to use it and um, how are you going to generate value for that audience? And your platform yeah. could be based around gaming or art galleries, displaying NFTs, um, yeah. collaboration, these kind of things. Yeah, exactly. But of course, it's it money talks, I guess, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Alexandra's popped that question again. Yeah. Um, I, <laughs> Um, the near team has supported T2 since the very beginning um, because T2 actually went through their uh, their accelerator program called Open Web Collective, um, and then they also supported us with one of their spinoff uh, venture funds um, that um, uh, has given us a, a good chunk of our uh, seed round um, funding, uh, which we'll be announcing uh, at the by the end of the month. Actually, so very happy, very excited about that. Um, <laughs> thanks, Mike. Yeah. yeah. I'm sure you guys can can hook up as well to chat about yeah, that. For sure. Um, 
Absolutely, yes. <laughs> Sorry, the short answer is yes. A yeah. strong yes. Uh, yes. So Alyssa said, what about the manufacturing industry? I don't know if you want to say more about your question, Alyssa. Yeah, yeah, yeah so, that, that would be helpful because I, I'm not quite... Yeah, I, I mean, so sustainability-wise, I mean, this is an opportunity not to travel, isn't it, immediately? Um, but uh, I guess if, if you're buying digital assets, you don't have to buy the physical ones quite so much. But uh, mm -hmm. if we can get a bit more from this one, who else has got a, a question? We've still got a few minutes on the clock. Uh, happy yeah. to have microphones on. I'm trying to scroll back up to see if there weren't any other. Questions. Yeah, I've been trying to capture them, but if I've missed any, I apologize. So, who's brewing up some ideas at the moment? Kapil, uh, yeah, what's on your mind? Hey, uh, first of all, very informative. Uh, on one hand, I'm trying to see what's the usage today in the business world for uh, NFTs and other metaverse stuff. And the most common usage which I hear about is meetings in metaverse, which is equivalent to Zoom meetings, but maybe with some more uh, AI or VR kind of uh, headsets. NFTs, I'm hearing more about smart contracts, uh, wherein uh, you can you can actually execute uh, without having and the way I see NFT, maybe I'm wrong, is, is, is more like a docu-sign kind of thing, where you have a contract and you then get, basically get a couple of parties to execute it on their side, and this is just a digital version of a contract. Uh, is that where the practical usage of NFTs and uh, metaverse is as of now in the business world? I know in the creative world, there are more like NFTs have been created for art has been created and stuff like that, where there's a lot of hype and the open sea and that kind of platform exists. But in the real business world, um, in the enterprise world, what's the key usages? I'm still trying to figure that out and my I'm not very clear on that. Um, that's a really good question. It's actually quite a few questions. Um, <clears throat> I guess the first, first bit is um, NFTs are, our smart contracts, but not our smart contracts, our NFTs. Um, smart contracts um, in, in the real world, um, I guess in the physical world, it's already, uh, I believe, being used to transact um, physical real estate. Um, so not just virtual real estate, um, but the, of course, you have some augmentation from uh, the, the real world, so to speak, because you want to be able to see um, or you want to be able to know that um, the, 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 the if statements have been satisfied, the conditions of the smart contracts have been satisfied. And to do anything with that in the real world, you're going to need a lot of um, human power to augment that process, the right authentication. Um, and there are different protocols working on this, authenticating um, off-chain um, transactions, off-chain events, authenticating uh, real world events, real world um, uh, objects, um, proof of ownership, etc. So um, um, I hope that. So, 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 so you interpret there. Let's take an example. You said property contracts, right? Now I'm selling a piece of land uh, to someone, and I can instead of selling it and registering it on land registry uh, in the UK, for example, mm -hmm. I can give them an NFT which trades the land. I, that way, I can skip or bypass the land registry. I don't have to pay any stamp duty or anything like that. I just trade an NFT on that land. Is that something, a real possibility today? Or is it more like, hey, it's possible, but no one actually can do it because it's not then legally enforceable? Yeah, it wouldn't be um, legally enforceable. So with something like um, um, a JPEG, for example, um, it's that's because regulations around, you know, ownership of these digital objects do not exist. There's a lack of them, um, so to speak. So, so you, you know, it was easy to implement that use case. But for example, for real world um, applications, you would need to obviously follow the existing regulations for that particular sector. So for real estate, no, you would not be able to um, bypass the, the registry. Um, um, I, I guess what I was describing is more of um, the NFT itself being used to ease some process of that, but the eventual, eventually with the landing point of that transaction will still be uh, very much part of the traditional, the existing process, right? And hopefully when regulation catches up, that will change um, because we sure don't need um, all of the hassle that comes with real estate transactions we, we have today. So. Yeah, and I agree, but the thing is regulation doesn't really change uh, very quickly. Uh, it takes decades sometimes to change it, especially something which is as established as, as land registry. 
It's been taking 23 years to just get quite a few properties onto land reg. Still, a lot of properties not on land reg, uh, but 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 uh, it's pretty well established. So changing it to NFTs might take time. Where do you see the major business case today for going in for these? And then I'm I'm not looking at the um, art based or digital art based transactions because I think that's where the hype is right now of NFTs. I'm looking at the uh, business world, the enterprise world. Where is the real use cases? Yeah, um, that's uh, other than um, so. My familiarity is really with uh, with DAOs, so organizing you know billion dollar businesses around DAOs. Um, but uh, other than that, I'm not too familiar. Uh, a lot of my classmates are experts in their you know respective verticals. Um, but um, oh, Richard's got a, some good information about other. Exactly. I was going to say I'll have to defer to actual experts on this specific topic that you're talking about. So, all right. Um, We're keen to hear your views on this afterwards. Then. Oh, we yeah. got, we'll be unpacking this all year. Yeah. Well, there's loads to talk about. For sure. Um, um, so I, I've got to dive, Sammy. Yeah. You, you've done your hour. So, if you, if you want to <laughs> sign off, you're very, very welcome to. Um, yeah. But I'll leave this session open. I'll leave you to decide. I've got to jump into another call. That was the hour. Yeah. So, Go if you got to go, and if people want to hang out, I'll leave yeah. the space open. Thanks, Richard. I'm happy, I'm happy to take the uh, the, the uh, baton from Richard for as long as this lasts. But Sammy, thank you so much. That was magnificent. Really, thank you for having me. Thank you. Yeah. I think we've got a hand up from yeah. Capil. Capil, do you want to put your microphone on? Uh, yeah.